Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, what did President Trump disclose to Russian officials and what's the impact on U.S. foreign intelligence? Also tonight, an update on Tempe's downtown streetcar project. And Wickenburg residents offer input on a proposed interstate that would run right through their town. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. President Trump's reported disclosure of classified information to Russian officials during a White House meeting continues to raise questions and concerns. The president's national security advisor said today that what the president revealed was, quote, wholly appropriate and that the president himself didn't know where the information came from which raises yet more questions. Joining us now is Philip Jones. He's a dean and professor in the College of Security and Intelligence at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. Um, what is the president reported to have done? The president is reported to have uh, passed on information about um, a plot by ISIS to use laptop computers to bring down aircraft. And uh, evidently, uh, the current thinking is that Israel passed on that information to the United States. Now, this was reported to be highly classified information. How highly classified? Very highly classified. Very. That would be top secret, code word, and compartmentalized. He identified the city where the intelligence was gathered, which has not been reported. I mean, mm. uh, the, the, the idea that Israel might or might not be the partner here has been reported. Mm -hmm. But to even talk about where the city, that's serious stuff. That could be, that could be, I'm speculating here, that could be Jordan. Uh, but what you, what you probably have to realize now is that ISIS, whoever was picking up this plot, now knows that there's somebody inside that is reporting to the Israelis. Not only that, but they probably know the area if the city where the intel came from was reported or was passed on to the Russians. Absolutely. Was this just, uh, was this a mistake? Did this seem as if it were planned? Was, uh, the reports are that he might have been just, the president might have been just boasting to these Russian, I mean, the foreign minister and the ambassador, Russian ambassador. What's going on here? Well, they're both former KGB, you know. Um, the president is in charge of the whole system of classification, and it's really regarded as part of his constitutional uh, powers. But when the U.S. government feels that it wants to declassify information, intelligence, and pass it on, then there's a lot of protocols. Um, you know, in other words, uh, you have to go to the intelligence agencies that collected the information and work out how that's going to be disseminated, to whom, and uh, there's a lot of... Uh, sort of thought that goes into how do you make sure that uh, you sort of cover uh, where it came from. And uh, Trump obviously doesn't know that there are protocols. I mean, he has the authority, that's true, but he's also in charge of national security. And so he really should be going through the protocols to, um, if he wants to pass information to the Russians. Right. Uh, the details of the arrangement apparently were kept from the Allies. The details tightly restricted, as you, as you inferred there, they're, they're tightly restricted even within the U.S. government. Yes, and we apparently didn't even pass this to any of our really close allies. Yes. Like Great Britain and Canada. I mean, there these, there are these countries called the Five Eyes, and we have constant um, uh, sharing of intelligence. Even some of our systems are common. But... Um, um, it, it's quite, this whole thing is pretty serious. Yeah, uh, no kidding. And it sounds as though, and if it is Israel, Israel didn't okay this information to be passed on to Russia. Whoever no. the partner was apparently had no idea this was going to be passed on. They had no idea, apparently. The Israelis are saying nice things, of course, that they still have a lot of confidence in the United States. But one of the most important things about intelligence sharing is you have to, it's called the golden rule. And, and that is you don't, you don't, pass on information you gain from a third party without asking the third party if it's okay. From and where you sit, does it seem like he just blurted this out? That this was something he, he learned and just couldn't control himself? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think um, uh, uh, he, um, I don't think he understands the system and uh, whether or not he feels he doesn't need to know the system. 
Um, that's you know up for speculation, but yes, I do think that impulse control may be a problem that he has. Uh, he did say, and his people are saying that he decided that Russia is an ally and that Russia should know this. Russia is not an ally. How can you call Russia an ally? That's what they're saying. No, Russia is not an ally. An ally in the fight against Islamic State. Well, they're not doing a whole lot against the Islamic State. So, um, I mean, they're, what they're doing is really bolstering the, the Assyrian regime and going after um, some of the rebel elements that uh, would like to bring down the Assad government. But you don't see a big effort by the Syrians and the Russians uh, against ISIS. Now, the National Security Advisor originally said no intelligence sources or methods uh, were discussed. That's right. But he wasn't accused of doing that. Yeah. He was accused of spilling the beans on where this was. Yeah, I mean, that was an important, you have to parse the statement by McMaster. He said two things. He said, no sources and methods were in any way compromised, nor were any forthcoming military operations that had, had not been publicly announced. Right. So he, he really was put out there to sort of begin the process, I think, of, of uh, maybe trying to get this a little bit under control. The tragedy is, is that, you know, you send these people out to speak to the public and then, then the president sort of <laughs> undercuts them with his tweets. Well, let's see what happens with McMaster. I mean, I have great respect for him. I'm glad he's there because, you know, he's one of the few people that you can really trust. We're now getting reports, though, that the president is losing patience with McMaster. He thinks he talks too much during meetings. And I think the quote was he was a pain. I mean, goodness gracious here. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, my I question, hear you. my question I hear was goodness you. gracious here. <laughs> that was my question. All right, so how much jeopardy now uh, in terms of the arrangement with the partner? You're saying Israel's saying all the right things. Mm -hmm. Does this jeopardize that arrangement or can it, it has to survive, doesn't it? It'll survive. I mean, the Israelis need us. We need them. Um, I think there'll be a lot of questioning about um, out in the community and in, among, amongst our partners, our allies. I mean, we have, we have a lot of relationships, not just with the Five Eyes, but we have bilateral relationships. We, uh, we work with other uh, services uh, on things like, well, Afghanistan, Pakistan, you know, all that. Um, so there's going to be questioning again whether you can really trust the United States. And it'll be more difficult for the, our people who are out there, our case officers uh, who are recruiting people to work with us, um, it's going to be more difficult because people are going to wonder, you know, am I safe? Am I safe? Will the United States really protect me? So do, so this, do, you, think, do you think this seriously undercuts espionage efforts around the world? I think it puts a real dent in them. I do think there's a certain undercutting. I mean, we've had, uh, we've had WikiLeaks, we've had Snowden, you know, and all of these things uh, have made a lot diff uh, more difficult to, to operate abroad. And last question, maybe it's just me, yeah. but the idea of letting a Russian state news photographer into the White House and having no American press there, does... does... It's, it's strange. And I, I think the underlying question here that clinks both Comey and uh, this disclosure is Russia. And I think a lot of us are wondering, you know, what is it about Russia that, uh, that uh, Trump is so positive about? This, this Comey thing, could this Comey thing be even more serious than the classified information leak? Well, if it's obstruction of justice, if yeah. that's how it's understood, it could be very, very serious. And the only people that are laughing about this are the Russians. I mean, you know, look what they've done to us. Look at the disarray in our government. Look at the people wondering about the American system, the legitimacy of it. You know, can we hang together anymore? I mean, it, it just, they've got to be the happiest people uh, in Europe. Yeah, it, it's just very strange. It's just, impo it's, it's like almost surreal. I mean, it's just, okay. Uh, good to see you again. Good information. Thanks yeah. for joining us. We yes, appreciate it. You're welcome. And next on Arizona Horizon, an update on the Tempe streetcar project. Hi, I'm Paula Kirker, president of PBS, and I'd like to personally thank you if you've made a contribution to Arizona PBS. You know, when you fund your favorite shows on this station, you're ensuring great television continues to be available for yourself, your family, 
and everyone in your community. One of the easiest ways to do that is by making a monthly contribution on an ongoing basis, what we call sustaining membership. When you call, tell us how much you'd like to donate each month. Our current sustainers tell us that $10, $15, or $20 a month is best for them, but you decide what works for you. After you've made that call, we will deduct that amount each month from your credit card or your bank account, and we will continue until you tell us otherwise. Your membership will always remain current, and renewal notices will become a thing of the past. Best of all, your ongoing support means that the best television on television will continue to come your way every single day of the year. So please, consider a sustaining contribution today. Thank you for your support of this PBS station. The city of Tempe recently learned that its downtown streetcar project will receive $50 million from the U.S. Department of Transportation Capital Investment Grants Program. The funds were included in an appropriations bill signed by President Trump. Here now to update the project is Tempe Mayor Mark Mitchell. Good to see you again, Mayor. Good Thanks see for you, joining Jay. us. Thank yeah. You. Before we get too far, define it. The Tempe Streetcar Project. What is it? It's a streetcar project we've been working on for many years. It's about a three-mile stretch. It will go from downtown Tempe, and it will connect uh, to our light rail on Apache. Okay, so I, I think we have a map that we're going to show here in a second or so, but this will go kind of kind of loop-de-loops around downtown, and then it, it, it goes down, uh, there we go, it goes toward Marina Heights there, Correct. and then it goes Dorsey Lane to the side. Um, why did you stop there? Well, I mean, the, 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 the cost. I mean, we'd like to move forward, and we're very ecstatic and happy that we were uh, alerted on May 1st from the FTA, the Federal Transit Administration, that we were receive $50 million. It's a $186 million project. Mm -hmm. um, $111 million is coming from uh, local funds. Um, 50, $75 million are coming from the Federal uh, Transit Administration. And then with the additional $13 million is coming from uh, public-private partnerships, which is really exciting because I think it's one of the first in the, in the state of Arizona, but maybe in, in, in the Southwest, where you truly have a public-private partnership where the business community stepped up and partners like Arizona State University and a lot of the, the businesses along the streetcar route, along Mill Avenue and Rio Salado. Uh, if, if we could show that map one more time, because I want to ask, how many stops now, if I were to get on at one end and wind up at the other. Are, are the black dots stops? Yes, I believe there's 14 stops. 14 stops. 10 minute intervals. It really coincides with our light rail. So it's efficient. So every 10 minutes, you'll have a streetcar stop on the 14 stops along the streetcar route. Okay, and now our next graphic, I think, will show a cross section of a street and how it will fit in because these things have to fit, now this is fitting in with traffic, correct? Correct, it's in the lane of traffic. All right, so what am I looking at here? What, 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 we've got streetcar only, and then we have traffic going to and from the other way, right? Correct. I don't know what street, I can't see what street route well, that is Well, I'm just trying to figure out, is it gonna block traffic? Is it gonna slow? No, am I gonna be honking my horn every time I'm on Mill no, Avenue? No, you're gonna be, follow, it's gonna be in the lane of traffic. So it's gonna, it's gonna flow with the lane of traffic, which helps move traffic. And really, the ultimate goal is to move people in and around the downtown area. So where that green vehicle, where that green uh, car is, that is a lane of traffic? That, it, yes, it, sh it should be a lane of traffic. That may be on Rio Salado. I don't know, I can't okay. read that from okay. here. Okay, well I think, our, our next graphic, I know where this is. This is like looking north from 3rd Street, I believe. And uh, that's that encounter, that's in that breakfast. That's right there. Okay, so that's that thing is it's gonna be in the middle. In the it's middle. Be, so it's going northbound on, yes. the, on Mill Avenue, yes. heading towards, uh, you know, heading Ferry Lakeside. Gotcha. So it's going northbound. It is in a lane of traffic. That is third and mill. That is a light rail stop there. And is that a left turn lane of traffic or a pure no, lane? No, that's of a pure lane of traffic. It's going north. Right now, there's one lane of traffic going north and south on Mill Avenue, and that streetcar route is going north. Okay, well, there'll be wires overhead. Well, one of the exciting uh, aspects of this is we're trying to have a wireless in the downtown area, and we partnered with. Um, a streetcar manufacturer that they will help us with that technology with the battery technology so in the downtown area because we love our downtown and our trees the technology is, is starting to get there there's other parts of the country that have a wireless parts of the streetcar and we're going to have the downtown segment as wireless That's now what we're shooting for okay so you, you mentioned you know, 50 million dollars already from the feds you were saying 75 million total are we still waiting for the 25 million the 25 how the FTA works in subsequent years if you get an initial funding in the first year the additional funding will be done in the next year okay so we'll be looking at the 25 million <clears throat> in the next year so it's coming it's coming there's it's no a good sign there's no question about that. there's no question about all right so that's and, and you mentioned you know uh, regional transit taxes and local taxes and in public private and the whole nine yards what about fares 
Will there be fares? There will be fares, but it'll be consistent with our light rail. But also, we understand that you know, for the students, you show your Arizona State University ID card, as well as the high school students, because we offer you know bus passes as well as light rail fares, as well as streetcar fares for our students and our youth in our community. So it's going to be consistent with our light rail. Okay, so. It, it's not going to be a free ride, in other words. It's not going to be a free ride. But we still have the, the orbit. What's unique about the streetcar is it truly complements our already uh, highly used uh, infrastructure when it comes to truly multimodal. So it's going to complement. You know, Tempe is one of the highest riderships for public transportation um, in the region. And having this component with the streetcar really complements everything that we have in our community. Well, let's talk about that, that, that complementary uh, aspect of it all. Because you got, you got the, the, the orbits, the blue things that are running all over the place. You got light rail, which is already running all over the place. You're going to have a Tempe streetcar, which is going all over the place. I mean, Well, it's not going all over the place. We would like it to. Eventually, well, we would like it to. Certainly, it's, when you get to downtown Tempe, there are things flying all over the place. Why is this needed? It's needed. We need to move. As you see, just in the downtown area alone, in real, in, in the Tempe Town Lake area, we have over 44,000 people that live and work within that area. And it's and with the stadium district coming online and with the streetcar um, on Rio Salado, eventually we want to connect it to Mesa. And we've been work, we're working with the city of Mesa. They're doing a study as well along Rio Salado so that we can have that connectivity to what we refer to as Wrigleyville West, but ultimately connect to the Mesa's light rail um, in the future years. Yeah, because you got what's going to be happening on rural and Rio Salado. Something's going to be happening there, you know. Rural and Rio Salado, yeah, there's a whole stadium district. There's 350 acres. That's equivalent, you know, that's 50 city blocks. So we're going to need to be able to have truly multimodal transportation options for our residents and for the businesses there. And it's just really going to complement everything we have. Now, obviously, with the streetcar going on Mill Avenue, we're not going to have orbit buses running there because we're going to have the streetcar. So that so will we're change. Going to, we're going to be looking at expanding the orbit system throughout other parts of the city to really make it complementary. Uh, the targeted passenger is... Who? You, me, everyone. So there's the targeted passengers. It's really the people, and it's, it's a really a quality of life issue for our residents. With the neighborhoods that surround downtown, it'll help preserve our neighborhoods, but it'll also help complement the existing businesses and making sure that we're able to move people in and around our downtown area. Let's talk about those existing businesses. What's going to happen when construction starts? It starts in June or something along those it lines? It does. We're going to start this June. We're going to, you know, we're starting in Mill Avenue in downtown Tempe in June, you know, when the issue is out of session, so hopefully we have less impact. But one of the things we did well and we learned uh, with the light rail is we're going to have a business assistance program that we're working on you know, partnering with Valley Metro to help with those businesses along the streetcar route to make sure that they're there to help them. It's going to be 24-7. We're going to reach out to the, those businesses. They understand it's coming because they know, look at the success we're having with light rail. And, you know, Phoenix is expanding. Mesa has expanded. Tempe, we're expanding with the streetcar. So it really goes hand in hand with the vision of what we're trying to do in, in and around the region. Uh, starts in June. Completion date somewhere around, what, 2020? 2020. It follow 2020. All right. Well, good luck, Mayor. Well, we're, thank root, you. we're rooting for you. Those of us have to drive around there, we root for you. Yes. All right. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Thanks, Dad. is a proposed interstate that could one day run right through the town of Wickenburg. The Sonoran Institute, an environmental group, has worked with Wickenburg residents to help them envision what this freeway might look like. The year-long report was recently presented to the Wickenburg Town Council. And for more, we welcome the Sonoran Institute's Ian Dowdy. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Good to see you, Ted. Uh, interstate 11, what exactly is it? Where exactly does it go? Well, way back in 1994, uh, Congress passed NAFTA, as we know, and they envisioned at that time in a transnational highway that would connect Canada and Mexico. They called it the Canamex Highway. The, the Interstate 11 is the first piece of that some 20-some years later. It's going to go from Nogales, Arizona, through to Las Vegas. And 
through Wickenburg. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right. So basically, the Sonoran Institute got involved by doing what? Well, we've, we've been involved with the Interstate 11 for about four years now, ever since it was in a feasibility study. And what our goal is, is to help communities connect with their natural resources and figure out a way to have a robust economy and protect those natural resources and the environment around them. Wickenburg is a logical place to work because they have a tremendous heritage around their you know, historic culture. Also, the landscape around them is a, an important piece of their way of life. So it was a great place for us to plug in and give them some tools so they know how to work with the Interstate 11 as it comes their way. And the bottom line is basically just getting public input on the project. That's correct? right. Yeah, to give them some tools that they can work with. Um, communities faced, particularly Wickenburg, they've had three major infrastructure projects in the past that have affected them. And they, they have viewed some of those effects in a negative way. Mm. Interstate 17 came along and people coming south from Flagstaff are no longer going through Wickenburg. Interstate 10 came along, people coming from Los Angeles are no longer going through Wickenburg. And now potentially Interstate 11 comes along and people coming from Las Vegas may not go through Wickenburg. So these are issues that they have and they need some tools so they know how to respond. So who did you speak to? I mean, who, who spoke to you? Yeah, great question. So we started this as a community engagement project. We went to the community, we went to, to children in schools and in summer camps. We said, give us some artwork, show us what you value about your town. We did a survey process where we said to the community, tell us what your values are. We compared that to some his historical data, presented that to the community that was led by a task force that the mayor had, had created called the I-11 Task Force. So it was vetted by the community, community members, a special task force, and then we did a design charrette. So we took, took them the alternative alignments and the areas that are of concern to them and said, how would you do it if you could do it yourself? And they came up with some great ideas. Yeah, it sounds like it. As far as in general, though, were they mostly, were residents mostly supportive of the interstate? You know, it really varies. Um, really, the question wasn't to them, are you supportive of the interstate? The question is, if and when it comes your way, what does the interstate do and how does it protect your values? Because we learned what the values of the community were. And they, we asked them to apply those values into designs. And they presented some really interesting alternatives that I think will be informative in the I-11 environmental impact statement. Let me ask it this way. Were, were the voices unified in this report, relatively unified? They became more unified as they went along. I mean, this is a, a community that has you know, very diverse values and interests. I mean, just like any community, they have their downtown that historically has had all of their ma, ma and pa businesses, if you will. Mm -hmm. They have their tourist industry, they have retiree communities. So there is no united voice, but through this process, our goal was to bring them together and get more of a united voice. And were, I think we achieved that. Were there concerns that you heard more often than not? What, what were the big concerns? Well, they really had two major concerns. First, they want to preserve the environmental resources around them. They appreciate the Vulture Mountains, the Vulture Mountain Park. They appreciate their landscapes. They want those to be retained. They also appreciate their community values, their, their unique identity, their sense yes. of place. That's a small town feel. That's a kind of a, a historic type of feel. They want to preserve that as well. And so those are the two main things that came out. And I think the solutions they put forward helped to address those. So reflect local character, mm -hmm. reflect local environment. Absolutely. You mentioned the Vulture Mountain. I think we have a, a graphic here of the Vulture Mountain area and where it looks like the interstate along with some power lines and stuff like What exactly are we looking at here? Well, this is an artist rendering. We worked with a group called Norris Design, and they pre presented to us some alternatives, some ideas for how the interstate could interface with other infrastructure. One of the ideas we've been putting forward at our organization for a long time is if you have to build a new interstate or new transmission or other infrastructure, it makes logical sense to go in places where impacts have already occurred. Right. So you can see the transmission line in this graphic that already exists going through the Vulture Mountain Park. The idea was think about putting the interstate near that transmission line or adjacent to it, having a lower impact on the environment and the resources. Well, that only makes sense. It seems like it. Yeah, yeah. We have another graphic here. Uh, this is a proposed overpass uh, in the area. What are we looking at? Well, the community came forward and said, you know, we want people to have an idea of where the town of Wickenburg is when they approach it from the north coming from Las Vegas. And so this idea was a concept, well, 
of, an, of a way the overpass can be constructed. So people who are coming south toward Phoenix can choose to go into Wickenburg for a, a short little jaunt, go get some ice cream, have dinner, whatever that is, and then get right back on the Interstate 11. So the idea was to present uh, r people who are traveling with Wickenburg as an option for them. I mean, it, that's, that's a really good idea. I mean, the idea of getting some elevation there so as you head into the town, you can see the town. That's right. That's yeah. a cool idea. Okay, so what becomes of the, now the design, it sounds like it's guidance. ADOT really isn't mandated to take any of these ideas, correct? No, well, they, they are mandated to receive the input. And right. actually, there's a public input session going on right now. Uh, ADOT's doing public meetings um, all across the region, and communities are encouraged to provide input by June 2nd. And so Wickenburg is taking this report. They've adopted it by their town council. They are going to provide it as a part of their input um, and communities all along the route are providing input at the same time, hopefully to drive better decisions around where the interstate might go. And last question here, I've got about 30 seconds left. What becomes of the report? Well, the report is adopted by the town council. We hope it's gonna be guidance, and we think it will, for how they're going to engage. There's really two areas we're focusing on. How can the community um, work to integrate Interstate 11 in their future planning, and how can they do advocacy with the I-11 project to make it the best it can be for them? All right, well, it sounds fantastic. Those designs, they actually made sense. That was kind of good to see out there. Well, a, lot of, a lot of good work being done, I thanks. can tell. Thank I you so it. much, we appreciate it as well. Wednesday on Arizona Horizon, Republican legislative leaders give us their take on the just ended state legislative session and the Arizona Theater Company's latest world premiere is a Sherlock Holmes mystery. That's Wednesday, 5, 30, and 10, right here on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Next time on Victorian Slumhouse. Look at the newspaper! The 1880s see tensions rise and political struggle.